All right, I'm calling meeting to order. Please rise to the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ask for a moment of silence now, please. I want to welcome everybody, people watching, and people in attendance. Start with a roll call. I'm going to start today with Commissioner Smith, Doug Smith. Here. Commissioner Mike Steven. Here. Jeff Culberson. Here. Vicki Cause. Here. And Mike Smith. Here. Public comment. Uh, I think we've got, um, Mark, I think this is where we got John Bradford. Going. John, if you would come on up and introduce yourself. Good to see you. Commissioners, good to be seen and good to see all of you this morning. I am uh, John Bradford. I am the first vice chairman of um, American Legion Post 411 family, which includes the American Legion Post itself and our auxiliary. And I'm joined today also by Tamara Sefcek, uh, who will also speak after I do. Um, the American Legion Post 411 and our auxiliary are probably one of the most active American Legion posts within the state of Kansas. And I want to start off by going through and discussing a lot of the things that we do for the county, uh, for the state and local communities. We support the uh, Boy State, Girl State, and Cadet Law Program, which is run by the state government. And that's primarily what I'm here to talk about today. We conduct and support at district level the state oratorical contest, which provides scholarships for students going on to college. We provide periodic uh, flag lines throughout the city of Lansing, and that's where we take uh, ten, 10 or so American flags and we'll go out and do a, a flag line alongside the street or a lot of times down at Dillon's. We do memorial flag lines at veterans' funerals and also at graveside uh, uh, services. We do an annual pizza party to recognize attendees at Boys State, Girls State, and Cadet Law. We do poppy distributions. Um, at large venues such as Dillon's uh, and other places. Uh, do, we do that over the Memorial Day weekend and the Veterans Day weekend, and that is one of our primary fundraising activities. We do an annual Christmas party along with the uh, Lansing VFW Post, and we do a Christmas gift support to local area veterans in coordination with the Leavenworth Council on Aging. Uh, and you've got that that uh, listing is in front of you. If you'll look at the next listing, we show the youth activity funding for the last uh, three three out of the last four years. Uh, it shows what we uh, raised and contributed to both the oratorical contest, to Boy State, to Girl State, and to Cadet Law. 2020 was canceled due to the COVID virus. Therefore, we have no data for that. If you go to your next page, you will find the projected experience, expenses for this year's youth activities uh, for Boy State, Girl State, and Cadet Law. Our total funds uh, that we will pay this year is $2,850. 
My purpose here today <clears throat> is to request a um, uh, subsidy or a donation from the county of 50% of that expense, which would be $1,425. Uh, we raised the $2,850. If we paid it all ourselves, that would come from donations uh, and poppy distributions and other uh, means that we raise money from. Uh, Tamara, would you like to? I just, I would just like to. Come on up here. <laughs> Gotta do it, huh? That's right. <laughs> you know better than that. Come on over here. <laughs> I just wanted to point out um, the cost of Girls State is a little different this year because they're going to do a virtual Girls State because they were considering canceling again this year, but instead they're doing a virtual week long. So next year the cost will go back up to the um, to the two hundred and fifty dollars that we put out. And one thing I should note. Um, we do, we do have the kids put a little skin in the game. Their parents have to pay a registration fee. So the cost of, uh, the actual cost of Girls and Boys State, 325 for Girls State and 350 for Boys State. So we do make them put a little skin in the game up front because we don't want them to have something better come along. We want them to really go and um, appreciate these, these programs that we send the kids to. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I think uh, some of you may have attended Boy State and Girl State or Cadet Law at some point, or you have children that, that have. But uh, there are many benefits for the children that, or the students that do go on to do that. Two years ago, I believe it was two years ago, we had a young student that went up and became the state governor in the program, and we also had the state uh, attorney general that Lancy won, and the student that became the state governor competed at national level, did not win, but he was accepted and is attending West Point. So <clears throat> the benefits of, of uh, supporting that program are or outweigh the cost. Awesome. And with that, I'll leave that decision in your hands. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank George. you. It's good to see you. Thank you, both of you. Okay. Um, Mark, did you? I think that was it. Okay, so administrative business, you have a... I do have some. Okay, if you go ahead. Uh, actually, the administrative business this morning um, is uh, news that we found out late yesterday. So uh, I'll have uh, Mr. Bill Nolan announce this. So we're excited to announce that we have uh, received our <coughs> funding for our application to the High Risk Rural Roads Program uh, for Tonganoxie Road. It is the southern 1.1 miles from the city limits of the city of Tonganoxie uh, towards the Stranger Creek Crossing uh, Bridge location. Uh, we were awarded $1.429 million for this project. Uh, the project cost is approximately $1.6 million. Uh, this is a 90-10 wow. matching wow. grant. It's, it's the highest percentage grant available uh, through the KDOT local projects. Uh, so it's a very good grant to get because it, it requires very little uh, local funds. Uh, this year in Kansas, they did uh, award $5 million statewide, uh, so we did receive a very large percentage of the statewide funds for this project. This is awesome. Um, KDOT will only obligate the first $4 million of, of funding uh, for fiscal year 2023, uh, so if we want to be in the 2023 20 schedule, uh, we need to our paperwork in a timely fashion and acquire any additional right-of-way uh, accordingly. And so uh, we will move that forward uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, the project is 1.1 miles long. It will revise the roadway section to include 12-foot travel lanes. Currently we have some portions of the roadway with only 11-foot travel lanes uh, and will include the addition of 6-foot shoulders. Uh, we did apply for paved shoulders for this location, so um, as approved, Without the details in front of us, we are operating under the assumption that uh, the cost associated was for the paved shouldering. Uh, 
the corridor four slope uh, will be uh, increased to a, a maximum of four to one, which will require a lot of fill for the project uh, in order to correct any edge drop-offs that are through that section of roadway. And uh, the crossroad storm drainage culverts, we have four box culverts through this section of roadway. They will all be extended to accommodate that new uh, sloping uh, that the project will have. Uh, there are also 10 driveway uh, culverts that will be revised and some additional other driveways that currently have mound entrances. Uh, trees and shrubs that uh, create line of sight issues along the project will be removed. Uh, the section of roadway will include new pavement markings and new signage that meet the MUTCD standards. Um, and edge lane rumble strips will be added after the pavement um, in order to uh, alert a driver of inattentive driving. The basis of the <coughs> improvements uh, were from the preliminary report that was provided to us as part of the local road safety plan. Uh, this location was identified in the preliminary uh, report, which we haven't received any final reporting. Uh, but we did request uh, before the application to receive uh, our top three locations uh, based <coughs> on crash history data. Um, this is the number one location in the county. And these recommendations that we applied for uh, were partially and in some instances fully based upon uh, that analysis. So uh, the local road safety plan uh, is, is the avenue in which we will have to apply for uh, funding per the KDOT guidelines moving forward. So exciting opportunity. Excellent. Especially, especially 910. That's just, that's, that's fantastic. Good work. Good work on everybody. Thank you. So will there be any realignment on that? It's not a realignment, just a widening and a four-slope addition. Okay. So we'll have uh, – Still going to – speed limit still going to remain the same? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, as you enter those Stranger Creek areas, you know, we have a, a lot of widening, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of dirt that will need to be brought in. Um, well, so that's that good because, you know, the 2006 to 16 sales tax was supposed to uh, do that from Tonganoxy to Leavenworth on Tonganoxy Road. Mm -hmm. So the voters didn't get it. So Coming back well, I guess we can we can uh, <laughs> we can help pay day. for part of the sins of our previous commissioners who <laughs> didn't do what they were supposed to do. Come back and correct it anyway, Doug. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Mike, did you have something? Yeah, I just want to say, you know, we've worked on through our work sessions and we've been working on where the three most problematic parts uh, areas for accidents in the county are and Two of those, we've gotten major grants from the state, and we're we're getting those solved, and that's a really uh, a great thing for the county. And I really appreciate Mr. Knoll and his yeah, efforts. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Bill. Somebody thank has to make these Bill. applications. That's right, and, and, uh, and we appreciate the state. Absolutely, uh, but <laughs> at the same time, uh, we've got to make sure we've got the funding. Sources yeah. available because we do not want to turn down any matching funds because yeah. they're mm -hmm. hard to get. Yes, mm -hmm. we need to. Yeah, we need to be a good player. Yeah, there's there's always they may have some extra money and they'll say, "Well, we'll send it to Leavenworth County." They're always good about matching. I think we're doing a better job of. of I think I know we are. Well, coordinating and cooperating and you're absolutely the competition for these funds, folks are uh, is unbelievable. So we can step up and say we perceive that much of a percentage of a only a certain amount of money that's allocated. I mean, it's just unbelievable. So hats off to you and your staff and Mark and everybody else involved. Jeff, do you have anything else on this one? No, I was just going to add to that. I've seen so many times previous commissions turn down right. grant money exactly. matches, and I'm pretty sure the consensus on this board is we will not let that happen. <laughs> Money is or they, they didn't want to spend the money for design to have a shovel-ready project to submit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so and I was getting I understand first. this is now. And that, and I know. They, and they I'm get just saying time. that's why we haven't gotten it in the past. Yeah. This well, shovel-ready, Doug, is absolutely, because that's the ones that are first looked at. So I think the commissioner's doing a good job trying to go down that road. And how many millions of dollars was the project there in Baser that we got through Mark? That's 8.2, I think. 8.2 million. So, I mean... People should know we're really working on roads. Yeah, yeah, we're we're up over ten million dollars countywide through Mid America Regional Council and KDOT for grant funding over the past uh, twelve months. And people compete seriously for, like I said before, yeah, it's, this, they it's they just don't give this to you. So right. Bill and the staff and Mark and everybody else has to go out and. 
apply for these dollars. So that's good news. Glad to, you can always walk in with that, okay? Yeah. All right. So yeah. we'll, we'll add that to administrative. We should, we should give you a steak dinner. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Sounds like an offer, Bill. Hit him up. Uh, I steak dinner. Up. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. <laughs> Mark, do you have anything else for us? Thanks. That, that was it for administrative. Senator, want to have Jeff? Senator, do you have anything you want to address? The so I was going to wait until, of course, if I just wanted to, I don't want to, I don't want to approach the subject until they. Okay, the okay, idea. I wouldn't, I wouldn't share it, that uh, okay. if you're bringing us good news or bad news. So I just want to get it out front and front. Yeah. Okay, all right, good to see you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's uh, my story. Mr. Chairman, that's <laughs> yeah. before we move on, uh, one clarification I think needs to be made. Uh, there were some comments made earlier in the week about uh, the tax rate that the commissioners, I think there's some confusion on that. Just just people should know that last year we did lower the mill levy in Lower yeah. County, yeah. The, the county commission. Yeah. I think there might have been secu confusion about which commission was being discussed, but Entity, I think that yeah. should be clarified. Yeah. yeah. Four or three out of the four years I've been here we lowered the mill levy. And the one year it stayed flat, and I voted against it. So, you mean you can't believe everything you read on Facebook, Mike? I, I guess not. Oh, okay. Okay, moving right along. Oh, I had one more. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Just real quick, and that's Mr. Lawfrey. Uh, have we received any guidance on our Recovery Act money and how it can be spent and where it can be spent? No, we haven't received any guidance on how the funds. Um, the original act itself is the only thing that's, that is uh, available so far. But the guidance from the U.S. Treasury has not been made available yet. Okay. So when we do get that, we'll decide if uh, what departments, if they can ask for funding, it's an allowable expense under that. Well, I think we'll have um, probably multiple work sessions discussing how that, those funds will be put to use um, in the county and okay. the best usage of those funds. And so, so we don't even know how long we have to spend them or if it's going to be... Well, right now the 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 recovery plan says uh, you will have up to four years to spend oh, okay. the funds. So it's not that um, but they still have not yet identified exactly how much will be Leavenworth County, the county's portion, versus everybody in the county's portion. So um, once we get that, as soon as we have that guidance, um, I will obviously pass that along to the board of county commissioners immediately. Okay, thank you, Vicky. Do you thank you? Just for educational purposes, is there not, or I? I think I read that there's a conference call of some kind that's being held tomorrow. It, it's a weekly conference and call. Weekly, um, are we going to participate in that or not? Yes. Or have we, well, that, I'm just saying you will potentially receive some. They, <coughs> they had um, those are weekly calls and and they hype them that they're going to have a bunch of information okay. and then you get on and it's usually we don't have any information yet but as soon as we do we'll pass along. But well, yeah, that's yeah, I good. don't. I, I listen in at least just in case they actually yeah. have some new news. But, well, that's kind of when um, I stopped listening in. But that, right. I, knew, I thought you were, so yeah. I was making yes. sure. Yeah. And it, I mean, it's hard to fault the Treasury because they have $2 trillion that they have to set up the rules on how it's distributed. It's not just the the money that's coming to the state of Kansas or the other states and counties. It's every entity that's eligible for those funds. They're establishing the rules on how that money's going to be distributed. So I can't imagine... Uh, the amount of work they have to put in to come up with guidance on how right. to appropriately spend two trillion dollars. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that we are keeping on top of it. That oh, yeah. you are keeping on mm -hmm. top yeah. of it. That you are participating and listening and, and absolutely taking note of yeah. what. Sometimes I even have to miss <laughs> other very important meetings. Too. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's another story. Yeah. We'll talk about that some other time. <laughs> okay, Vicky, do you have anything? Else? No, that was it. Mark, were you finished with anything? Yes. Okay. I, I want, Go ahead, Mark. Question, and the county councilor is not here, but Mark, I don't know if you know the answer to this. But do you know if uh, Mr. Herring reached out on the Paradise Trailer Park issue to the county councilor? I do not know. Okay. Thank you. All righty. We're through with um, Mr. Vez. We go to consent agenda. After reviewing, is there anything that needs to be pulled off it? If not, I'll take a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move that we accept the consent agenda as presented. Second. second. Motion and second. Any discussion on it? Mr. Smith? Aye. Mr. Steele? Aye. Mr. Coverson? Aye. Cause? Aye. And I vote aye. Okay, moving on to formal board action.
Consider a motion to authorize the chairman to sign the master service agreement between Lovewood County and Nat Standard Incorporated. Go right ahead. You summed it up well, Commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> I can read. That's about all it is. <laughs> uh, this, this document should have been before you a couple of weeks ago when I brought a couple contracts uh, for Net Standard, uh, but I did not bring the master services agreement, so it requires your approval and a signature. There's no funds attached. This is just a base document uh, that identifies some stipulations and rules uh, regarding any business that we enter into with Net Standard. Uh, County Council has reviewed the document and has no objections to any of the language. All righty. Questions? If not, I'll take a motion. I move that we uh, authorize the chairman to sign the master service agreement between Leavenworth County and Net Standard Incorporated. Second. Motion and a second. Any more discussion on it? Okay, I'll call the roll. Mr. Smith? Aye. Mr. Stephen? Aye. Mr. Culberson? Aye. Mr. Cause? Aye. And I vote aye. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll leave the document with the executive right. secretary. Yeah, she'll track me down. Thank Thanks, you. Larry. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. Thanks, uh, Number B, consider a motion to approve the council on aging to enter a contract with Terry Booker for 2222 through 2026 nutrition services and catering. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good morning, Connie. Um, here today to seek approval to enter a contact with a contract with Terry Brewer for Terry Booker for um, nutrition services and catering for our Meals on Wheels program. Um, we utilized uh, an open process. We contacted all local um, catering services as well as some larger catering services for this program. Um, unfortunately, we received just one bid, but fortunately, that was uh, Terry Booker. Um, every year we do an annual review of our Meals on Wheels program and 94% um, of our um, constituents are very happy, Good. satisfied with that service. Um, the other thing that um, we were very happy to see was uh, just a slight increase in that cost. Um, it's a five-year contract that we would hope to enter um, with, uh, I believe, a 15 cent increase for the next five years. So um, Mr. Uh, Booker has been extraordinary yep. in his efforts to support us through um, the pandemic and um, making sure that we don't miss a meal uh, okay. and our folks don't either. Yeah. So um, would uh, seek approval for that contract. I'm pretty sure other parts of the state don't have a caterer delivering <laughs> the council on aging. <laughs> You know, Especially a caterer like that. He does yeah. an incredible yeah. job. He does. Care. Yeah, he does. Um, I contacted about five area um, county Meals on Wheels programs. Most have gone to a frozen meal. Yeah. Um, our folks, uh, even given a 30% increase in that program, receive a hot meal every day. Exactly. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I know a lot of people have been involved in delivering those. I, I, I know the people appreciate it, but to have somebody that does that for a living be our person that prepares it, I think it's, that's great. That's great. Any other comments on it? You ready for a motion? I'm ready, Jeff. I would like to make a motion to approve the Council on Aging to enter into a contract with Terry Booker for nutrition services and catering. Second. A motion second. Any more discussion on that? Well, I just want to say I've heard a lot of positive comments about what's going on in the Council of Aging. Thank you so yeah. much. And, yeah. Uh, Me too. I think it's exciting moving to the new facility. It'll be a great thing. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And we're opening back up and providing new, I mean, reintroducing the Program. original services. I know that, you know, we're having the gentleman's coffee that's starting up and the sewing club and all of the things that are going on. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank if, you, Tony. Once we get exercise going, we'll have a lot of help, happy, healthy people. That's what they call about every day. <laughs> You're going to have to do exercise. <laughs> yes. You're going to be down, doing do a fundraiser things. this year? Uh, we're hoping to uh, okay. in October Later. our Meals on Wheels benefit. Okay. And don't forget the that thing. they have got yeah. the grandparents that are raising grandchildren program <laughs> up and running, and I think that that's something that's very it's needed. An, so an incredible staff. Yes. Uh, here, hoping to open up all of those activities. Okay, that's good. Well, Connie, I love the energy you bring to it, and I'm very pleased with that. Any other comments? If not, I'll call the roll. Mr. Smith. Aye. Mr. Stephen? Aye. Mr. Coberson? Aye. Mr. Collins? Aye. And Mr. Holtz? Aye. Thank you. Okay, to continue on with you, consider a motion to approve the council 
approve the Council on Aging to enter a contract with Loveworth Paper Supply for nutrition programs, consumable supplies. Uh, again, same process. Um, this is also a five-year contract. Um, we did solicit bids from some other um, companies, including online companies. Um, what we found was that their prices were almost double that um, of Leavenworth Paper Supply. Um, there is an, a slight increase in pricing this year from Leavenworth, but if you'll um, notice, um, the items that had a particularly uh, Significant increase are all ones that were pretty COVID-specific. Um, plastic gloves, bleach, aluminum trays. I think the um, carry-out business for restaurants and catering is something that's really impacting those and impacting those prices across the yeah. country. So despite that, um, there was not a price increase for the previous five years. So given uh, this price increase, um, we were pretty uh, happy with the prices that uh, – they did offer us and would uh, seek approval for a contract with Leavenworth Paper Supply. Well, we can't deliver the meals if we don't have anything to. <laughs> That's exactly right. So <laughs> send a hand out here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other questions for Connie? If not, I'll take a get a motion. Mr. Chairman, Chairman, I move that we award the contract or sign the contract with Leavenworth Paper Supply and supply to nutritional program consumable supplies. Second. Motion is second. Any more thoughts or discussion? Just it's local business. Yep. We need to support local. You got that. I'll start with Commissioner Smith. Aye. Stephen? Aye. Coberson? Aye. Gauze? Aye. And I vote aye. Okay, thank you, Connie. Thank Keep you up the good so work. Much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to presentations. I think we're at uh, Core Civic. Is that right, Mark? Yes. Okay. Good to see you. Yeah, come on up. Come on up. Go wherever you wherever you Wherever you feel comfortable. So you're in the laptop, that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, if I take my mask off? Yeah. Thank you. Well, this is a, uh, it's a great honor. I'm, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my background here in a minute, but it's a great honor to be in front of this body and talk a little bit about this, uh, this opportunity. I, uh, uh, just a quick plug, I uh, went to Lansing High School and the American Legion sent me to Boy State back in the, in the 80s and got to meet the governor, which was amazing. I think it was Mike Hayden. So, But it's a real, real honor to be here today. I'm uh, Damon Heinegger, Natasha Metcalf, David Weed, and I'll let them introduce themselves here in a few minutes. But we're from Nashville, Tennessee. That's where Core Civics headquarters is. And Grew up in uh, Lansing, uh, Lansing High School grad, Kansas State undergrad. Got married right across the street at First Presbyterian Church. And uh, grateful to be, be back and have a few minutes with you. Uh, this <coughs> um, I will go ahead and click through the slides here. We've got a few things just to present, but before I do that, I'll let Natasha and David introduce themselves. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Uh, my name is Natasha Metcalf. I am uh, Vice President and Partner Contracts Counsel with Core Civic. I've been with the company for just a little over uh, 18 years. And my primary responsibility is negotiating and managing all of the contracts that we have with federal, state, and local governments to uh, operate facilities where we house prisoners. Welcome. Um, good morning. My name is David Lee. Um, I am the uh, senior director in partnership with Core Civic. I manage the, um, our relationship with our local partners across the country. So all of our cities and counties that we, we have uh, business with. Um, I work on the work on those projects uh, for the company. I've been um, with Core Civic for five years now, and um, we're happy to be here. Thanks so much for having us. Welcome. Welcome. So again, Damon Heinegger. I've been with the company 29 years. Uh, actually started as a correctional officer at the Leavenworth Detention Center back in 1992. Uh, worked there for a few years. Worked uh, at a facility we uh, own and operate in Florence, Arizona. So my wife and I, right after we got married, moved down there. And uh, I've been uh, CEO and president for about 12 years. Again, last 25 years have been been in Nashville. Mom and dad still live in Lansing, and actually was over there last night on Helen Street to have dinner with them. Uh, so just a quick word about Core Civic, and then get to why we're here this morning. Um, so Core Civic, formerly Corrections Corporation of America, been around about 40 years. Uh, founded in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, we do really three things. We own and operate prisons, jail, detention centers. So that's the Lovemore Detention Center is the example of that that we've been. Uh, owning and operating for about 30 years. Uh, but we also uh, build real estate uh, for government to be the tenant. 
So another great example in Lemworth County is the new Lansing facility, the that facility that now is operated uh, by the state under a lease with us where we provided the, uh, the real estate and it was constructed by J.E. Dunn. We call that core civic properties. We've been doing that for about seven or eight years. And then the last thing we do is what we call core civic community. Uh, these are facilities, typically halfway houses, reentry facilities, usually housing individuals in the last you know, six to 12 months before release. So they're helping individuals get gainfully employed. You're familiar with this, uh, obviously, this solution because I think you've got several facilities here in Lemoore County that do that work. So core civic safety, again, that's the Lemoore Detention Center is an example. Core civic property, the land facility is an example of that solution, and then the reentry facilities, which we call core civic community. So all in, we have about 75 properties nationwide. We have about 15,000 employees, uh, and we work with federal, state, and local governments. So that's a, just a quick summary about uh, Core Civic. You know this facility really well, but just to uh, highlight a few things about the Ludworth Detention Center. So this facility is uh, just behind the Ford dealership. Been there since 1992. It's a uh, facility that uh, pretty much exclusively, as you know, is housed federal prisoners for the United States Marshal Service, which is the agency within the Department of Justice. So these are federal prisoners uh, that are typically out of the District of Kansas, but we also hold a few from Western Missouri, and I think the Dakotas and Iowa and Nebraska also, those uh, marshals up there every once in a while put some prisoners in this facility. We do not only the services within the facility, but we also provide transportation, so likely know that we've got buses or vans going down Highway 73 to Topeka or Kansas City to uh, produce individuals to federal court every day. And uh, we do some programs, but probably you probably know that these individuals are very transient. So they're probably 30, 60, maybe six months in our facility as they go through the federal court. And if they ultimately are convicted and sentenced of a crime, then sometimes we just drive across town here and take them to the USP and uh, deliver them to the Federal Bureau of Prisons while they serve a sentence, or maybe somewhere else in the uh, in the Midwest. At a high level, it's about 1,000 beds, the facility. I have about 175 employees. Uh, as you probably know with the, with the, uh, the jail that uh, you have oversight on, that uh, cost for that facility, most of its salary and benefits. So it's about $18 million. That's our total payroll for those 175 individuals. And just under a million in uh, utility costs that we pay annually and also about a, just under a million dollars that we pay in annual property taxes. So been here for about 30 years. We're very grateful to be in uh, Loveworth County. We've had uh, we, what we believe a great uh, run for 30 years. We've had multiple renewal contracts where we had to go through a procurement process to renew it. So we're thankful that we've had a 30-year run where that's not been interrupted. And uh, more than you want to know, but there is a national accreditation body that's been around since the 1800s that sets standards for uh, operations, both services but also the real estate. And you'll see up there it's called the ACA accreditation. We just received uh, here in the past year reaccreditation. I think we've been through seven or eight cycles now since the facility opened, and we got a 100% score on that. So this is where independent outside auditors will come in look at every nook and cranny of the facility, determine if the facility is a, um, appropriately maintained, uh, check cleanliness, you know, food servers, medical maintenance, but they basically, from soup to nuts, check out the facility, and then this uh, independent body determines if it should be accredited or reaccredited. And again, we've not been, we've not missed a beat on that one. We've been accredited since 1993 at that facility. So let me um, get to why I'm here and why we're here. Um, first, to say I always want to take an opportunity, again, this is the first time I've gotten an opportunity to be in front of this body, to say thank you for your support. Uh, being a 30-year neighbor, we're grateful for the support that we've had both from the City of Lovemorth and Lovemorth County. And again, we're really excited about being a new neighbor in the uh, City of Lansing with that with that project. So I always want to say thank you. Um, probably every once in a while you get a, a question or a comment or maybe a complaint, and uh, we know we always have to kind of keep the lines of communication open, especially with our warden. Uh, to maybe address those issues. So thank you for, for that 30-year uh, partnership. The real reason we're here for uh, this slide here is um, the new administration, so the President Biden's administration, there has been um, discussion leading up to the actual inauguration about how they may, through the United States Marshal Service, uh, contract directly for services, for detention services. 
And so uh, we've been uh, in discussions. Obviously, Marshall Service is a 30-year partner with us. We not only do it in Lumworth, but we actually house, in addition to Lumworth, house about 10,000 federal prisoners in any given day in our facilities around the country. So it's a customer we know really well. Uh, and so in, in this kind of period of transition leading up to the inauguration, um, we also were curious about how both the agency but also ultimately the administration thinking about how they work with the uh, the private sector because we monitoring obviously uh, some of the positions and policy statements that were made during the uh, uh, respective campaigns. So uh, in late January, President Biden signed uh, many executive orders, uh, one of which was a direction to the Department of Justice uh, which, again, has the Federal Bureau of Prisons, which obviously you know them really well, and the United States Marshal Service, that those agencies could no longer directly contract with a provider like us. So the agreement that we have today and the agreement we've had for the last 30 years, it is a direct agreement. So it's Core Civic and Marshal Service that are the two individuals on that contract. And that's, again, that's been the model since 1992. The direction now for the Marshal Service is that uh, for them to consider or them for them to um, pivot to agreements uh, that would be government to government. So moving from a government to direct contract again to a private provider, move from a government to government agreement. And you probably likely know the sheriff actually already has one of those agreements in place. I think on any given day the sheriff holds about 5, 10, maybe 15 federal prisoners for the Marshal Service. The Marshal Service have about 65,000 federal prisoners on any given day around the country. So these are, you know, obviously prosecuted by U.S. attorneys, ultimately uh, get their case decided by a federal judge. Of that 65,000, about half of those prisoners are in local facilities like Lovemore County. So just over 50, 52 percent sheriffs around the country hold federal prisoners in their local facilities and probably don't co-mingle, but they probably just have some space set aside for those federal prisoners. What we want to talk to you all about today is the idea of using our facility continue to be a space for the Marshal Service, but look for Leavenworth County potentially as a partner uh, to provide those services there. So you'll see here in these two columns on the left, current structure with the Marshal Service emblem on the top. They contract directly with Core Civic, and then Core Civic at our Leavenworth facility with our employees, we provide the entire services. So both the facility, physical facility, but also from the warden down to the correctional officers, those are full-time employees of the company. What we're proposing for you all to consider is a new structure on the right. So the Marshal Service then will contract with Leavenworth County, so it would be a county uh, federal government agreement, so it would be a government-to-government -government agreement. And that's important because that would comply with the executive order. So it, wouldn't, uh, it would be allowed then in the executive order, so that's important. And then Leavenworth County then would take over the operation of the facility uh, and provide the services under our agreement. Again, you've got an agreement today with the Marshal Service. A little in the weeds, you, you maybe could ask a question, do you modify that agreement today and expand it for Leavenworth? That's a discussion potentially for another day if you're, if you're even willing to entertain this conversation. But what we would envision, if this is something of interest, is that the uh, employees that we have today, some of which have been there you know, 20, 25, 30 years, that they would transfer as employees over Leavenworth County. So these would be county employees. Uh, and so from the leadership on down to the front line would be all uh, county employees. Now you're probably saying, well, what the heck? Man, this is, this is uh, interesting or you know, how would this all work? Um, we have done, you know, been around 40 years, we have done transitions back and forth with sheriffs around the country. There's been some times where a county sheriff has decided to transition to private management. We've made that transition and vice versa. We've transitioned our facilities over to a local sheriff. So we, we, we've got the playbook on how that, how that would work at the local level and we've actually also done it several times at the state level. Um, so we, we have, again, the, the wherewithal and expertise on, on, the, uh, on the transition. But if I can go to the next slide and just go a little more in detail. So on the left there is again what we would suggest is the new structure. This would be the again agreement, marshal service between the um, uh, that agency and, and Lovemorth County, and it would um, 
then have that, that agreement with, again, the service provided by Leavenworth County employees, the county would lease actually our facility for the place of performance. Then let me just, before I talk a little bit about kind of the logistics here and a little bit of the, the items here on the right, why would this be of interest to the marshal service? Um, well, quite simply, it's it's a place they know real well for 30 plus years. So they like this location. It's very strategic because it provides good location to the federal courts, both in Missouri and to Kansas. Again, we provide transportation. That's a really important service that the marshal service really uh, appreciate that we provide. And then you may know also that um, the national transportation system for the marshal service an entity called JPATS. Their biggest hub is in Oklahoma City, but probably their second biggest hub is Kansas City. So almost every week, maybe two, three times a month, our employees are going across the river to the tarmac at MCI, and we're delivering federal prisoners that go on their air transportation system, and they go around the country. So location-wise, this is a very ideal location. Uh, that's, that's a big part of why the Marshal Service would be interested to keep in this facility. The other key thing, and this is probably obvious to you all, is that federal judges, uh, you likely know, like to have their uh, individuals that get produced to court in close proximity. So if the capacity is lost here at our facility, this likely means then that the population would be moved probably in various facilities around the state, probably Missouri, where they've got capacity. Now we've got a, a thousand beds. And you probably know better than I, there's not a probably local jail that's got a thousand beds in available capacity for the marshal service. So that probably means that they have to do 30, 40, 50 other jails, in smaller quantities to make up for the displaced capacity. So that's why the marshal service are interested on in seeing if there's a way to keep the capacity of this facility. Um, but I'll also say, obviously, the federal judges, uh, this is important for them just because they know then daily. Prisoners can be produced on time for their respective cases, and they don't have to wait, you know, two, three hours if they're, you know, maybe a, a county that's maybe, you know, you know, potentially 100 to 200 miles away. So that's the interest of the marshal service. So let me talk a little bit more about this slide. Again, you're probably saying, "What the heck? This is this is uh, this is obviously something a little different." <laughs> that's an understatement than Lumber County has done in the past. However, um, in one way, you're already running it because these are your employees. These are people living in the city of Lovemore, city of Lansing, or maybe surrounding areas. So, again, we've got employees that have been there 20, 25 years providing these services. So our intent would be to have, again, if this is something of interest to the county, that we'd work through a transition to where we would have these employees uh, become employees of Lovemore County. So, again, you don't lose then the, the leadership and the expertise and the training uh, policies, procedures, and whatnot, that's not lost because you've got basically employees just basically changing their uniform and working for a different uh, jurisdiction. But another thing that we can do, and this would be a conversation for another day, again, this is a lot of what ifs. If, if the county is interested, and one thing we're going to propose is um, today, basically our suggestion to the county, if you're interested, it is to get the other party at the table, and that would be the marshal service. So this is of interest to you. If the marshal service are interested in this, then what we would do is roll up our sleeves and get around a table and talk about uh, what we call support services we could provide to the county. So again, Core Civic's been working with the marshal service 30 years. We hold 10,000 federal prisoners on any given day around the country. Uh, we work with leadership both at the local level, so the United States Marshal that is you know, appointed by the President here locally on up to the Director of the Marshal Service. So we know the agency, their needs, um, kind of expectations really, really well. And so what we would suggest is that we would have a support agreement on the side. And again, this would be a conversation with you and the Marshal Service on uh, what can we do to help support the operations? In addition to providing the actual physical facility under a lease. And so we just give you an example of some things on the side. Um, so for example, in the middle there, legal. So Natasha's our vice president for uh, negotiations with the customer. She's been doing that for almost almost 20 years. Uh, so she knows how to negotiate the agreement, amendments, new provisions get uh, uh, added, 
how to think about them, how to get it um, interpreted. That is an example of something that we could do as a side agreement uh, from one phone, stop, phone call away or one email away where we could provide support to the, uh, the county. Uh, HR, real estate, finance, uh, partnership, operations, these are all other examples. But this would be a basic a menu at the right time. Again, a lot of what ifs. If the county is interested, if the marshal service is interested, we could be uh, a support services partner on uh, helping the county with the operation, both on day-to-day, but also um, on kind of unique things that pop out, up, may come up. Additionally, we would, of course, having the ownership of the facility, we would have full-time employees on site for the maintenance of the facility. And you're probably aware, Lansing, that's exactly what we do. We've got, obviously, Stadium Kansas employees operate the prison, but we do also have employees for the core civic that are there on site every day maintaining the asset. So everything from a um, you know, HVAC going out to you know, routine, routine maintenance to if there's you know, damage from a hell storm, our employees are on site providing real-time support to the state of Kansas. And that's what we would suggest uh, in this situation, too. Finally, and it's probably important to note, again, a lot of different uh, uh, categories there, um, but probably a really important one, uh, and that's the last one, and that's finance. So contract pricing and cost justification. So probably one question you would be asking is, you know, what potentially would be the cost uh, to Leavenworth County? Uh, we would work with you to provide not only cost justification to the marshal service, but also may help you with the actual agreement to where you would have no actual cost from the county's perspective. So this would all be fully reimbursed by the marshal service and the, uh, the, the federal government. How we can do that, one, we've got 30 years of actuals. So we'll pull out our P&Ls. You'll see uh, exactly in black and white exactly what it's cost us to operate a facility. So that's 30 years of data that I'll see provides clarity on uh, on the actual cost. Again, you know this better than I, two-thirds of our actual costs are salary and benefits, but that's pretty easy. You just calculate, you know, employees, salaries, and benefits. But also uh, all the variable costs like medical, food service, again, we've got actual data that we can uh, provide. The second thing is that the uh, federal government under these agreements, typically, and it's all, you know, subject to negotiation, but, you know, typically... Uh, we'll do one-year term. So say a one-year term contract and say multiple option periods. What's notable about that period of time is that uh, basically at that one-year period, then you go back to the federal <coughs> government and say, okay, I've got 12 years a day or 12 months of data, and this was a little higher, this was a little lower, but you can adjust your cost for the coming year based on those actual, um, actual costs. Additionally, and I don't know um, exactly how the uh, personnel structure is uh, here in Leavenworth County, so I'll just speak to maybe other, other counties that I have experience with. Sometimes uh, the employees are under a collective bargain agreement. They're unionized. And if those costs go up, so if you've got kind of set increases yearly for uh, personnel, uh, again, under these agreements, the, the federal government would reimburse you dollar for dollar. So you wouldn't have to absorb if you had a cost of living increase or something, again, that was negotiated under a collective bargain agreement. Uh, you just have to provide that data to the marshal service during the anniversary period, and then they make an adjustment on the revenues. So the goal would be then to be cost neutral to, uh, to Leavenworth County with this, uh, with this operation. One last thing I want to say on this, on this point, and that is, and again, you probably see this a little bit, on the um, agreement that you probably got already with the county uh, jail with the marshal service. But every once in a while they'll have a new standard or a new requirement and they're, they're saying, you know, we've got to incorporate this in a contract. We do this every day. We probably do it a dozen times a day uh, where these come in from different uh, contracting officers. We've got the wherewithal to interpret it, what that means, but also we can quickly determine, okay, is it going to be a cost or not? That's really important. And so uh, what we do before we sign any modification, we'll say back to the marshal service, okay, we've read your proposed amendment. You're incorporating this standard. You've got X, Y, and Z, what you're expecting. It's going to cost us X, new employees, something like that. And so we would want reimbursement dollar for dollar on the adjustment. So that that is uh, very routine for us. We do that all, all the time. And, again, it's something that we would – 
uh, at the right time. Again, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Be very clear on this. I don't want to get the cart for the horse. But if that is something of interest, that is another uh, complimentary service that we can provide in that entire bucket there on the on the um, on the right. Let me see before maybe Tosh anything you want to add to that. And of course, I know you've got got questions, but. Um, I guess one thing I would just say generally also about the uh, about the agreement. So the um, marshal service again going back to the size of that agency. So the federal law enforcement agency, Department of Justice, they have about five thousand employees. So these are marshals and chief deputies and, and deputy marshals around the country. Um, they don't own or operate any facilities themselves. So they completely rely on us or you all counties for bed space. They uh, so these agreements they do with counties they've been doing them for decades you know probably 40 50 60 years the good news about these agreements and again you've got one here already a live one with the sheriff's office but they're typically 15 to 20 page agreements um, so pretty pretty straightforward so you're not talking about a thousand page document that's got all these terms and conditions and, and complexity they're pretty pretty straightforward agreements uh, have just you know general standards uh, and, and requirements. And um, again, what we would do, again, to, if we get to this point and it's of interest to Lovemorth County, is that we would uh, work with you from the beginning to the end. So, and negotiating the actual agreement, helping understand the terms and conditions of the contract, help with the cost pricing and cost justification. And again, like I said, the good news is is that we'll open up our books and show you exactly what our um, what our actual costs are. So that would. Give, Clarity then exactly on how the price is uh, going forward. But let me know, Mr. Chairman knows probably a lot of questions, happy to answer those, but maybe Natasha, anything you'd add to kind of that overview? I think you've covered it well. He usually does. <laughs> Damon's got good. Cause before we go in, for, Senator, would you like to make any comments? Good to see you this morning. Good to see all of you. Senator Pittman here, Jeff Pittman here, Love North Lansing. Uh, I want to thank you, first off, each and every individual here. You know, it's been a hard year, and I want to thank you for your service to our county. Uh, I know you don't get that enough. You know, it's a, it's a tough job, and I get it. And uh, you come in here every week do your stuff. Um, last time I was in here, we were talking about COVID. We were talking about the vaccines, you'll recall. It was probably February, and we were wondering what the capacity problem was. Now we're out here. With most of us have gotten our vaccines. We're doing quite well. And we're getting ourselves through the pandemic. So now we got to refocus ourselves on the economics of our state, right? We gotta look at jobs, jobs, and jobs. We gotta look at, we've invested, we get, the administration's had about $2 billion of an investment in the state over the last year. And that means good economic prospects. But when I chatted with Core Civic about this proposition, what I heard was 175 jobs, maybe more, could potentially be lost here in Lenworth County. And I said, well, we've gotta do something about that. Stories are that Senator Ed Riley, my predecessor, came in and advocated hard to get this facility here. And so I think it's, it's my due diligence to come in and say we need to do what we can to keep this facility here, keep these services here, reimburse ourselves for that property tax that might, might, might be there, might not be. We need to understand the finances. We have a long partnership with Core Civic. Um, and they, you know, Sometimes we've had a few bumps over at Lansing, but it's worked out. And I appreciate the interactiveness. I appreciate the CEO being from our local hometowns. That's a big thing for me. And um, I think we need to focus on those jobs and figure out what can we do to keep them here. I think they've come to you as a county. I'm willing to go to the administration as a state if you, if you guys pass on the offer. And then we're going to go to the federals and say, what, could you, what would it take for you guys to run this facility? I don't know if those are options, but those are options in my head. And uh, But I think it's good to think about this. I think we've got to, when it came to the Lansing facility, some of the considerations you'll want to think about um, as you go forward. You're going to want to know how solid are the terms with the U.S. Marshals. If we get into contracts with our employees, what happens if that drops out in the U.S. Marshal Service and there's some kind of contingency plan for if they then let... Um, um, the private operation of those things, what happens at those points. And then, you know, is there a way to finance the county a little bit for the impact of not having economic development on that space, you know, those types of things. But I think that this is a good op uh, opportunity. I really appreciate Core Civic coming forward with something that keeps these 175 jobs here in Lemoore County. I'm excited about it. I hope you'll, 
at least consider the opportunity with uh, with a, 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 a positive attitude and look to the considerations is I'm here to serve as any kind of help I can as a conduit to the state, uh, the U.S. Marshals, to Core Civic, to you guys, or just to be here to, to help support any way I can. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you, Senator. It's good to see good you again. Good seeing you. Thanks. Okay. Just one thing before we get to get to a few questions. This is probably not the place for all this because if we're going to have a continued discussion, we're probably going to have some serious work session. First, first of all, Damien, welcome home. Glad, it's glad to see you. Uh, you know, we've spoken before on this a little bit. My only concern was, you know, some of the executive orders that are coming out of D.C. kind of scare me. Um, and so to, I would only want to make sure that the county, when it's all said and done, is protected, just like you're trying to do. Right. They've put you in an awkward position. I think CCA has been successful all over this country for years. I really believe that. But I've got to make sure when we all sit down and talk, if that's what the other county commissioners want to do, that the numbers add up. I also like to see that, besides the 175 jobs, uh, maybe there's something else that, that the county can receive as part of keeping it in town. I mean, we're, we're in a Kansas City metropolitan area, and we definitely want to grow this. And these commissioners are doing their best to try to do that. But this this is something that's probably going to take a lot more discussion. Um, I just want to thank you, first of all, all of you, for coming out. I had no plane trouble this time, and it's good to That's see right, you. Right, right, right. So, uh, time don't get on a plane in this trouble. That's not a good thing. Yeah. Uh, but I, I just want to make that st open statement, and then I'll turn it over to any uh, commissioner that would like to say something. Thank you. Mike. I have a couple, two or three questions here. Uh, first of all, the legality of the executive order. Uh, it, I'm sure your organization has had legal counsel look into the legality of the executive order. I've heard Oklahoma and some other uh, jurisdictions are challenging the executive order. Where does that stand? And connected to that, uh, if we make this transition, would we have the ability to transition back to private when administrations change or conditions or circumstances change? And uh, what is the primary ob objection that the administration has to the status quo or private prisons right now? So could you address that? That's pretty wide open. Yeah, great questions. Uh, really good questions. Uh, the, the first one is, yeah, our, our read, and we've heard concurrence with the Marshal Service and they've heard concurrence with the Department of Justice, is that the executive order, uh, as it's written, would, would require the Marshal Service not to do any direct contracts. So that, that in all the vetting they've had in the last, you know, 60 days, this would impact them. So they could not do a direct agreement with the core civic. So we've, we've heard that definitive uh, feedback from, from the Marshal Service. Now, to your, I think the second part of your question, I have heard there is some, I think, entities around the country that are challenging in that. We are not a part of that. We're not engaged on that. We're just following the lead of our customer here, which is with the Marshal Service, and, and trying to figure out a, uh, a thoughtful but creative way to help them take advantage of the capacity they've got, in this case, in, in Lemworth, um, Lemworth uh, County. To your, I think your second question about you know down the road, does this potentially get uh, a transition back back and forth? Um, possibly, uh, possibly. You know, uh, who knows what the, the future holds? But uh, we've done it both ways, as I said earlier. So we've transitioned operations to government. Government's transitioned operations to us as a as a as a private entity. So that would be um, you know a, poss a possibility. I think you know, assuming you agree. Any change, you'd like to think about it long term. I mean, this is kind of an obvious point, but I, I think any change we would want, we'd want to think about it to hopefully where it's a durable and, and not something you have to do every four or four or five years, but I'll say that, that is a possibility. And then, forgive me, Commissioner, I think your last question was uh, uh, what is their objection, objection to the status quo? What, why, why are they so objecting to uh, the way things have been operating? It's it's a good question. I don't know if I got a, a great answer for you. It's I think there's there's some uh, parts uh, around the country, both at the federal and state level, where there is a strong view about is this service that we provide is it inherently governmental function? So there there is you know no surprise to you I'm sure there's there are some individuals that think that the operation of our prison or jail detention center <coughs> is inherently governmental function and that should should remain that way. So I think you, we've seen over the years, you know, both at the federal level and even even at the state level, maybe that view uh, contrasts a little bit when you've got to change it, change the administration. So our our view has been for 40 years is that at the end of the day, if it's the Marshal Service or if it's the state of Kansas, 
we understand views and priorities change. You know, people turn over in elected office, and we want to be we want to be flexible and innovative to kind of meet the needs of whatever that new administration could be. Thank you. Thanks. I have a couple more, but I'll let you ask everybody else. Who's Doug? What kind of time frame <clears throat> does this have to be decided on? Great question. So our current contract. Um, at the moment, cannot be extended under the executive order. It's December this year, so end of uh, end of twenty one. But we are targeted, and, and I, I don't want to speak for them, but I, I do think I, the marshal service do appreciate that um, some time is going to be needed to not only you know get people up the learning curve, but also talk about appropriate transition because we would all be well served to make sure we've got a very smooth, but you know, a good length amount of time for it for a transition. So at the moment, December, but that's a that's a discussion for another day about kind of what would be the right amount of time for a transition. Well just trying to figure out why they would do that because this is this everybody's nobody's had anything bad to say about it's this. It's been a win win. It's 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 I just this has worked for thirty years, so that's why we're in the Midwest, and they're up there. And we did contact our delegation to try to advocate for, you know, a reconsideration of this decision made by the administration, but it seems to be to no avail so far. But hopefully maybe there can be some changes. But I think that my concern was, and I think that that was kind of addressed with Commissioner Stephen, is the what if, okay, we as a commission, I think we do need to have several sessions to discuss and to kind of weed through all of this, all of the, the issues that could surround this. But um, what happens if the rug gets pulled out from under the county, you know, and that we're left holding the bag, and that's something that I don't want to see happen, you know, and, and we have to do our due, due diligence to make certain that, that there are safeguards in place and stop gaps that that could never, and, and, and that's kind of almost impossible because to say never is <laughs> never say never. But it, it's just we need to make sure that there are mechanisms in place to protect the county. Absolutely. Well, let me, uh, this may sound a little selfish, but um, I, I want to be in good graces in Lemworth County going forward uh, since my home. So obviously you've got my personal commitment that uh, obviously we want to make sure we do nothing that puts the county in peril. Right. So I know those are just words out of my mouth, but um, this, is, this is home for me, so I would want to make sure it transitioned really well. Uh, a little bit to your, I don't think it was a question, but a comment, but we have informed uh, Senator Moran's office, uh, and, and, and to his credit, he has been engaged on this issue and has made some phone calls and, and whatnot. So he's, um, and he's aware that I'm having this conversation with you all today. Okay. So I think you all would know better than I, but whatever he could do to support, I think he would say, yes, I'm, I'm ready, willing, and able. To your last point, so, you know, we, we're always, you know, thinking about worst-case scenario. And so if I could put myself in your shoes for a minute, because I think you make a really good point at the end there, is that, you know, what potentially could be the risk for the county? So what we, what we would propose, uh, and again, this is pretty standard practice for the Marshal Service, is that they have, um, again, about a 20-page agreement, typically a one-year term with, you know, uh, unlimited option periods. So kind of, you know, can extend for hour long one-year options. So you got basically a 12-month kind of time horizon uh, where you're providing that services. If during the course of time, say the marshal service, you know what, don't need these facility, don't need a facility anymore, then you know you've got kind of a one-year uh, obligation uh, because you've got a one-year agreement. But the other thing I would say, and this is probably important to note, is that our current contract, um, and this is pretty standard practice, we have a fixed payment in that. So probably the sheriff, I don't know for sure, but the sheriff probably gets reimbursed on a, on a census. So they've got five prisoners during the month of February. That's how many that they get paid for. We actually have a fixed payment, and against the standard practice for both counties and direct contracts, uh, where there's a fixed payment. We know exactly what that amount is. We get it every single month. And then above that fixed payment, if there's a population above that, then we get on a per day basis, so kind of like a hotel rate. The reason that's important is that what we've always done is our, again, most of our fixed costs, salary and benefits, we put it in that fixed payment. So we, we know, without a doubt, we'll get those dollars every every month that covers our fixed costs, notably our salaries and benefits. 
And then again, we know they got we've got the time horizon for one year. So again, things go. The marshal service saying, you know, next year we don't need it. Well, you know, you got that fixed payment up until the expiration of the contract. So it gives you certainty on the cost. And these again, these are things you negotiate. And then the final thing that I'll say, and this is just an obvious point, um, is that you know the county uh, obviously wouldn't have any risk on the real estate. So we own the real estate. So you wouldn't, uh, you know, potentially yet, you know, if there's again a, a worst case scenario where they didn't need the facility, that also still would be owner operated by, or that would still be owned by the company. So you wouldn't have an asset say, okay, what am I going to do with this vacant detention center? That would be our our issue. If that makes sense. Thank you. But yeah, really, really good questions. Yeah. Well, <laughs> there's a lot. There's a lot to talk about too. Yes, I'm sir. sure, but. I think this is exactly what we're here to do. Um, I don't think enough people out there are paying attention to what's going on with this executive order. Um, Core Civic is the biggest taxpayer in Leavenworth County. That means if we lose Core Civic, every single person listening and watching and in Leavenworth County, their taxes are going to go up. And I don't think enough people are paying attention to that. It's not just losing 175 jobs. And not only 175 jobs, there's all the supporting subcontract jobs, you know, that it affects, you know, uh, to run the run the place. So if, and like I said, there's a lot more to talk about, but I think this is exactly where Leavenworth County would need to step up. Some concerns like Commissioner Cos has, I also have, what if the uh, feds just changed a couple words in the executive order to include counties? You know, there's, like I say, a lot of things to worry about and talk about and work out. But I think we definitely need to do something from the county commission level, whatever we can do, to support this idea. I've been trying to figure out a way to get five more core civic prisons because, like I said, they're the biggest taxpayer in Leavenworth County. We had five more. I could lower the mill levy on everybody's taxes. So not only not getting five more, maybe if the county gets involved, that would be a, a segue to maybe make that happen. So the biggest point is, though, if we lose this, Everybody's taxes is going to go up. Right, I and think we that's what's going to resonate with, with all the taxpayers. So whatever we can do, if we need to join in Oklahoma's uh, lawsuits or whatever, you know, can be done. But it, I like the, the idea of pivoting to the county in this situation. Um, as far as the tax uh, payment, I think, if, if I'm correct, the, the leasing part of this would um, – Disqualify it from being tax exempt, so we wouldn't lose the biggest taxpayer in the county. We wouldn't lose taxes, yeah. So we'd still be a private property owner, so yeah, taxes wouldn't be affected. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm definitely on board with this. Seems like we got some more work sessions to do. Mike, did you have, did you have another I question for me? A couple more. Uh, your staff, but you said it was unionized. Uh, if we if we made a transition to being public employees. We're, will the uh, collective bargaining agreements be transferable or uh, signable, or what? What happens to those collective bargaining agreements? And, and forgive me, actually, we, our staff are not unionized. Okay. I, I was just, I was wondering. I'm, I'm not sure if the county, like the jail, no, the no, we don't. Okay. No, so, no. so no, no, there would be no, no union. So no, no issue. No issues there. at all. Okay. And so that, but one thing, probably important for you to know, a little bit to my point earlier, and that is. Um, if, if there is increases in cost, so if there is a, I don't know if the county has a kind of a set COLA that you do for county employees, but whatever, whatever that cost is, that would be reimbursed dollar for dollar by, by the marshal service under that agreement. Okay. Does, is the liability to the county going to change if we transition to this? It would. So it'd be it'd be similar to what your agreement is today with the marshal service, uh, and then what we can do when we do the cost pricing and justification, we can give you our actuals and just show you kind of what that liability is. It could be the case whatever your carriers are, you may want to expand as appropriate. If that's increased premiums, again, that would all be reimbursed of the cost of the contract again. Okay. And is this something that? And this may be a mark question. Uh, is this something that would be involving or negotiations would involve the sheriff? Or would it be involving uh, the commission itself, or how do you see that working out? I, well, um, first of all, we have had some conversations with the sheriff. Um, we had a conference call with Core Civic, and the sheriff was involved in that, um, just so you know, he's not operating in the dark here. But I think those are all things that the board would have to decide as part of these work sessions and just any future discussion on how we want to um, 
operationally handle that within the county organization? You know, one thing I'd ask, um, instead of getting all these questions out here, I'd ask the, because um, it's obvious to me, unless you all tell me different, that we we got some work sessions coming up on this, which I'm fine with. I'd also think that you might want to generate your list of questions to Mark so he can get those prepared to see Damon so we can know, because this is, this, is, this is a big task. We can't underestimate what the, what the responsibility of the county will take. At the same time, uh, the last thing I'm going to see is see those doors closed. That, I, that's just not that's just not acceptable. In fact, I'm with Jeff. If there's something else, another product you did, we'd like to see you bring in here too. Um, but I, I think if it's all right with the county commissioners, we'll go ahead and um, leave it as it is and start getting questions, and we'll ask Mark, uh, county administrator, to set up some uh, uh, some meetings so we can have some more discussion on this. Is that I, I would suggest that we. If we're going to do that, we set those meetings sooner than later and yeah. maybe even off schedule because they are under a timeline with the contract. That, I mean, a December thing, if there's a need for Core Civic to go to the state as opposed to the county, we need to respect, you know, yeah. giving that um, time to kind of have that process move forward because, you know, the, well, first of all, the legislative session is over. This is that is going to be almost an impossibility for the state. So there's there's a lot that we're going to have to look at, and I think that just out of respect for the process and what's happened, um, and kind of get those set, and then encourage our federal delegation to come in and involve themselves in this process. Yeah, and I think it's and our state from, delegation. And I think it started from that you're in already, but we can definitely do inquiries and say we need we need assistance on this too. I just have one more comment. This is just, this just a general comment on this. Is This is an example of the direction that I don't agree with from the federal government. Is This is going to force us to move, move jobs from private sector into public sector. And, uh, I mean, these obviously will be government jobs. We'll be growing government, and mm -hmm. it will be forced on us by the federal government. I'm not against it. I think we're going to have... I, I don't see we're going to have a choice, but you can definitely see the direction of the federal government, and this is just one little tiny aspect of that. Going larger. Okay. All righty. If everybody's okay, then we'll uh, we'll let Mark, we'll look to get some questions. We'll allow you to set it up, and you all work together. Really appreciate you taking the time out here, and we're very interested in this. Let's see if we can come to the table and get, uh, get this completed. Senator, I appreciate your comments out there. And uh, thanks again for coming out. Yes, sir. Thank you, Thank you very, much. very much. Thank you. Thank you for working to try to kind of see what we can do to fix this. Okay. Thank you, folks. Um, let me get the lights back on, Jeff. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't mind. Commissioner, there's something that keeps coming up that I'd, I'd ask that maybe you look at. And I know the reason you all did it. Um, we've got an executive uh, session coming up, but I, but I hate for people in the audience to wait. No, I'm, I agree. I, I'm wondering if from now on we construct a, a county administrator, and I've talked to Mark about it, that have the executive session the last thing, no matter what. That way people don't have to wait 20 or 30 or 40 minutes. Just a second. I'd like to talk to Mr. Bradford for just a second. You want what? I need yeah. to catch Mr. Bradford. John? <laughs> you want to go? Yeah. I'll, I'll be okay. right back. Okay. There's anything to vol volunteer? Any volunteer? We'll volunteer Vicky once she's gone for it right now. <laughs> okay. So, Commissioner uh, Smith, I agree with you on on that, but I will remind. Uh, I, I personally liked the way we did public comment before about a year ago when we did all the public comment at the beginning of the yeah. commission meeting, and then then anybody that came to comment, they and made the trip up here to Leavenworth, they were doing it at the beginning of the meeting. There was no waiting wait at all. Because yeah. uh, making folks wait at all, to that's, me, is that's a problem. That's why we changed the work session. I mean, that's why we did 1045. That's why we're doing this. I don't want people to have to come up here. I just wish we did the complete public comment at the beginning and be done. Oh. But just a reminder of our schedule, though. Right. The, a reminder of the, way, the reason that change was made is we, at the time, we had a lot of public comment coming in on, us, on a couple of items. And we had people like Core Civic who were agenda. here on the agenda yeah. and they ended up waiting for an hour and a half to two hours yeah. while people who weren't on the agenda that's came exceptional. That's a, that's a good that's a good point. Let's let's do this, Mike, if it's all right with you. We're making some changes as we go along because the board and 
uh, let's fill that weight. Let's go ahead and do the do the one on the on the uh, comment thing, public comment, and have executive next, and then let's let's take a look at the next one doing it. I understand what you're saying, and everyone doing that, but I also know the issues y'all had too before uh, when I was watching on Zoom. So if if, if this and I'll, I'll vote for Vicky. If everybody's okay, we'll start putting the executive sessions at the end of the meeting. Is everybody okay with that? Okay. With that being said. Vicky's been volunteered to serve on the. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Okay. Break committee. Okay, okay. Additional public comment. These are five minutes, right, Doug? Mm -hmm. Okay, we have some folks in the audience, and I think I've got your name down there. So, if you would, you have five minutes. If you come to the uh, podium and uh, give us your name and address, we'd appreciate it. I have Kirk Peterson. Good morning. Good morning. Who's my timekeeper, Doug? Are you my timekeeper? Uh, <laughs> Mark's over there. Mark was, the, All right. the bell go off. So my name's Kirk Peterson. I live at 20618 Mitchell Road, which is uh, ironically because of the first thing that talked about today with your grant. Uh, Mitchell Road is just south of the bridge that was reconstructed about nine years ago. And when I heard about the grant for improving Tonganoxie Road from the city limits all the way to that bridge, um, it's only ironic that when that bridge was closed nine years ago, the traffic that Mitchell Road took on with that bridge closure, we still decided to move from Johnson County, Kansas, to get a huge tax rates in Johnson County suburbia and DeSoto School District. And uh, I grew up in Horton, Kansas, and driving my wife, who's from Denver, through Leavenworth County to go to my home place where I grew up. We ended up buying 160, 155 acres on Mitchell Road. Um, the road bridge was done um, after by the time we had moved in. And the reason I'm bringing all this, and I appreciate as a retired military individual as well as a 4 H'er, the parliamentary procedure and the discussion that I witnessed today, I can see that this body is fair and um, understands process. What I'm asking this board and this 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 group of individuals to do is to relook at process because after moving out and developing our 155 acres eight years ago of Lincoln Farms Estates LLC and working with planning and zoning and public works as well as the board at that time which was three people um, I thought what we had to do to develop our property was fair and reasonable and what I've learned by looking at another property three weeks ago this weekend, because I'm tired of the dust, I'm tired of the traffic, I'm fr quite frankly frustrated that I'm not been listened to about all the things going on in Mitchell Road. I've called the dispatcher six times in eight years on speed. I've stopped people on my road for speed and dust. I've only been there eight years. I brought all these things to the attention of individuals in this room. And I feel like they're falling on deaf ears. But when I went and looked at another property with Dan Lynch, and Dan Lynch is a huge developer in this community and this county, and he asked me, why are you looking at another property? I said, I'm tired of the dust. I'm tired of the traffic. I'm tired of not being listened to. He said, well, it's getting ready to get worse. I said, what in the world are you talking about? He said, Mr. Brewer is developing Mitchell Estates on your road, eight 10-acre lots. Didn't you get a notice on it? Uh, no, we didn't get a notice on it. So I've since been educated and learned that the rules changed, that I don't need a notice or any of us in the community need to be notified because it fits within the regulations of a Kansas statute or something. When I developed Lincoln Farm Estates eight years ago into six tracks, I had to have width and depth and only two driveways per half mile. My wife and I hired an attorney and we put restrictions on our development so you couldn't put a double wide, an earth contact home, a commercial business, or any of those things on our property. I did it right and was reasonable based on traffic, accessibility, and beautification of the area of which we moved to. The rules have changed. There was hearings. One of my neighbors challenged my development eight years ago. 
One commissioner sided with him, the other two voted for it. I had to pay $1,200 to get a driveway added to my development after the first plat was approved. $1,200 to add a driveway. I followed all the rules, I paid it, I paid over $10,000 in survey fees and other expenses to have my property developed the way we wanted it, to not offend my neighbors, and to do it within the means of what the planning and zoning and the commission at that time had. But if it hadn't been for Dan Lynch telling me about Mitchell Estates across from me and my neighbors at the back of the room who've been there well over 30 years, none of us in this area, Mitchell Road and 203rd Street, I refer to Mitchell Road and 203rd as the biggest cul-de-sac in the county. You cannot get out of 203rd Street or Mitchell Road but I, it's the only cut through from Dempsey to the junction of Tonkinoxie Road and County 9. I get all the commercial traffic, three garbage trucks a week, school bus every day. With COVID, it's an ATV side-by-side -side runner event on Saturday and Sunday. Okay. I've got notes here that I'd like to have put in the public record of a lot of history and what I'm talking about. And I'd appreciate this body changing process for transparency for the people that are affected by these changes in zoning. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank Who you. Who do I give this to? Thank you. Senator. You can just look right there. We'll make sure it gets to on the corner. Right there on the corner. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, is Gary Smith in? Is Gary? I didn't think Gary. Gary, uh, Gary. surgery and that didn't make it to yeah, that I with his pain him. meds. Yeah, I, I didn't see him in here. I know Gary. Gary and, and Joe Herring will not be able to. On okay. the public comment today. Margaret Smith? Margaret? Yes, ma'am. You come up here. I would first like to ask either the zoning and planning or the commissioners, uh, why were we notified that this was going to happen? And when was it first proposed to the planning and zoning or however that works? I'd like to know that. Also, we have lived on the road for 54 years. And in that time, that road has been nothing but a dust bowl. We have people coming through, cutting from County Road, Tonganoxie Road and County Road 9. They use that road more and more because of all the housing that has gone in here in Leavenworth County in the last 54 years. Uh, I believe that this housing that's being proposed will affect my husband and I as much as anybody because that ground has always been a hay field or a time or two they planted corn. When these eight houses go in, it will affect us about as much as anybody because the driveways are going to be right in front, some of them right in front of our house or just to the side, each side, in the 10-acre lots. Uh, when eight houses are built on that road, that means anyone that can afford that property in the first place is going to have two cars at least. Then you will have relatives, you will have friends, because we all know that happens. Uh, it just seems like to me before any of that housing development is started, our road, Mitchell Road, should be paved, black topped, because when this happens, 
we are going to have every kind of delivery made to put in the basements, to fix the driveways, uh, to the people coming to uh, build the houses, the lumber. All of this is going to happen, and it will be basically right in front of our house. And when that happens, too, our 54 years of quiet time goes down the tube. And we will have also driveways that practically come right in front of our house. I know we can't stop progress, but at least the road could be paved to help the dust. And as it is now, the cars fly by, the dust, you can't keep it out of the house. I can't even open, even now, my windows on the south side of the house. It's bad enough that I can write my name at the end of every day after all these cars go by. So I honestly believe the best thing to solve some of the problem is that road is paved. Okay. And that's how I feel. Well, we appreciate and you. Thank we you. Are, my husband and I both are 88 and a half years old. We've had all this quiet time and now that's going down the tube. All righty. We appreciate you coming up and letting us to hear your comments, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, I have a little trouble hearing. Could you speak up? We just said thank you for coming. Thank you. If that's all that you had to say. Okay. Thank, thank, you, thank you very much. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Scott yes. Jacobs. Scott, you come forward. Thank you. Morning. Morning. Yeah, I live on Mitchell Road, too, and uh, my concerns on the road, the dust, murdered my mother-in-law. I've lived here 25 years, ate dust, mud, not taking care of the road, uh, just going to get a lot worse. That's basically all i got to say. I know there's not nothing you can do about the houses, but if... Uh, taken care of it's your health. Okay. Would that solve the problem, do you think, if the road was... Yeah, hell. It's okay. terrible. I got a boat. I like to go up to the lake. I can't wash it and bring it home and or wash it at the house and leave. Cars. It's terrible. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Scott. Julie? Jacob? Good morning. I, that was my mom that talked earlier. So basically, I've been out there uh, all my life. Uh, I put up with the dust as a kid growing up. I bought my grandparents' house, and my husband and I have lived there 25 years now. Uh, same thing, the dust is terrible. Uh, when it comes to building these eight new houses, I have a couple concerns. Uh, like the one neighbor said, when he plotted his out, he had half half a mile between driveways. There are going to be eight driveways in a quarter mile distance now, which I don't understand how that how it can change that much. Uh, also have an issue with uh, sewage. We live out in the county. We don't have uh, sewer lines. Um, if it's the same as my parents' ground, which is straight across, uh, it has maybe two foot of topsoil, and then you hit sandstone. So I'm concerned on laterals. If they put laterals in, they're going to have to be towards the front of the property because it has a natural slope, and I don't think they're going to be able to dig deep enough to have run runoff with the laterals. So are they going to be putting lagoons in? in front of our house. Uh, 
you know, the wind blows from the southwest most of the summer. I don't want to be smelling it. Uh, I don't want it there. I probably can't change that, but those are my two main issues. Uh, when it comes to the dust, it's terrible. Uh, we are we have seven driveways on that, basically a mile and three quarter road. It's going to now be 15, so it's more than doubling the houses. We have uh, McGraw fertilizer down the road that uses this access between County 5 and County 9. And we put up with them going back and forth and back and forth all day long. All the dust. Now we're going to have to put up with dump trucks taking rock through. We're going to have to put up with heavy equipment coming through to put these houses in. We're going to have to put up with trucks coming through with lumber and concrete trucks. Not to mention all the dust from the people that will be building these houses. It's bad enough, now we're going to just quadruple it. Plus, from what you were talking about earlier in the meeting, they're going to do um, some improvements to County Road 5 or Tonganoxy Road. So people will probably be taking County Road 9 and cutting through so they don't have to go through the construction. So that's also going to increase our road traffic. So I guess my main issue is the dust. And with all this extra traffic that's going to be going through with this development, it's going to be almost impossible. You won't even be able to go outside without breathing dust. Okay. Thank you for your comments. Appreciate you coming up. Thank, Thank you. you. John Roper. Good morning, John. Good morning. John. How you doing? I'm a uh, John Roper, I live at 16478 Evans Road, and um, I was here last week while uh, Mr. Van Paris was giving an update on a, a sewer connection yeah. that has been, for some reason, declared illegal and inappropriate. So I kind of wanted to set a little bit of the record straight as to what's going on. I would really like to request to have a meeting with the Board of Commissioners of Sewer District Number 5 so that we can really discuss this and resolve it. The... Uh, primary issue at hand, this, this area was developed years ago, and this is the documentation for Phase 1 of Ginger Creek, and in the diagram, in this drawing, it states clearly the outline of Sewer District Number 5, and this is where the house sits, clearly inside. Here's the plat with the county. Our houses within that district. Um, this was all part of phase one of a uh, project that was done. Here's the, the ultimate drawings of what was done. Here's phase one, which was completed, which includes her house there. And with all of the discussions of then turning it over to a sewer system through the city of Baser, this was all redone and new drawings were getting being prepared, which removes the lagoon and puts it onto the sewer system. So as it stands now, this whole sewer system was designed, built, and paid for by Mrs. Roper and Raymar Properties. This was no cost to the county. She built this system. Her house and all of these plants and these, these other subdivisions were built into it. The lagoon was designed per these specifications. I also have specifications for the sewer system designed to take on the first 100 houses. There's currently only 38 connected to it. The current forced main that is connected is capable of holding 50 houses. And now, for some reason, it has been dictated that Marianne has to have a septic system installed. And she was steered towards Mr. Uh, Digger Jim, I guess. We got an engineer. And we had a drawing put up, and then from Digger Jim, he gave her an estimate of $42,000 to install that septic system. And that doesn't include the trees that are going to be required to remove at $1,500 a tree. It doesn't include the fact that it's going to destroy your driveway and it has to get remade. 
and it also doesn't include the fact that it's going to tear up our sprinkler system that's going to have to be redone. We're looking at probably fifty to sixty thousand dollars to put in a septic system to turn around for a sewer system that's coming in that we're already connected to. And I just think sitting down with the sewer commission and, and, and figuring all this out because we'd also like to get into the next phases of the development. How are we supposed to get to the next phase and get these houses that are already into a subdivision that was approved years ago that's now within the city limits of Baser and that the conflicts between zoning and planning, we don't know how to get to the next step because nobody will talk to each other other than we're, we're wanting to get attorneys involved and that's not going to solve anything. We just want to sit down and figure out how to make things better, how to get this issue resolved, as well as to get to the next step in the phase two and phase three of these developments and and try to do something, get something moving forward. So I'm here humbly asking that we have a meeting of the, the Board of Commissioners of the Sewer District and simply discuss this. That's all we want. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roper. Okay, a question for Mr. Lawfrey. Uh, who would you recommend that Mr. Roper approach or, or contact to continue the conversation? I'll defer to the county counselor. Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, uh, I spoke to you last week on this matter. I also spoke with the board, sitting as the board of directors of Sewer District Number 5, uh, in the early spring, excuse me, mid-spring of 2020. As a result of that uh, meeting, in, at which time the board considered the fact that there were two homes connected to Sewer District Number 5 that had never been part of Sewer District Number 5, that were remote from the boundaries of Sewer District Number 5, had never paid for any of the assessments of Sewer District Number 5, but were receiving those services. At that time, the Board of Directors of Sewer District Number 5 directed me to send letters to the two properties informing them of the facts and that they needed to be disconnected. That letter was sent in June of 2020. Uh, we're here today to basically re-examine that very same issue. Now, I will do whatever the Board of County Commissioners or the Board of Directors of Sewer District Number 5 directs me, but I would offer this, the alternate facts that are being offered to you this morning by Mr. Roper, I do not believe are accurate. I think they uh, neglect to point out several issues, such as the fact that the connection was known to have been made, but was done, I'll use the word surreptitiously, with respect to the sewer district uh, number five operations. Again, it never paid any assessments or any of the operation and maintenance fees. The county has looked, your staff has looked at whether or not those two properties could have been feasibly connected to sewer district number five without penalizing the then current uh, residents of sewer district number five who had paid their assessments and operational and maintenance fees over the years. We do not believe that that is feasible. Uh, we believe that including them would, uh, in essence, financially penalize the existing owners and would render the possible future development of that sewer district or incorporation of that sewer district into the city of Baser wastewater treatment system exorbitantly expensive. Now, again, I'll defer to whatever policy decision the boards wish to make, but I believe this issue was examined in the spring of 2020. Over a year has passed. Uh, we have given, no, we, uh, Ms. Roper has contacted me, and although my letter in June 2020 gave her approximately 90 days, I believe, or some short per shorter period to disconnect, uh, that disconnection has not taken place. I did receive communications from an attorney representing Ms. Roper. Uh, quite frankly, I don't know who represents Ms. Roper, either Mr. Roper or their attorney, but uh, I'll defer to whatever policy decision you've made. But I would remind you again, this matter was brought up last year. Uh, if you wish to revisit it, you can. Well, let's, let's, let's keep it short. We're trying to get... Go ahead, Mr. Brooke. And let's, let's keep it. We're not gonna, this is not the place to sit and argue this. This is just... Yeah, no, I, okay, I agree. Couple, with couple, that's, couple. that's the reason we'd like to have a meeting with yeah, the Sewer Commission. A couple, couple um, comments. Uh, in reference to his comments about the meetings last year or whatever the Sewer Commission had, 
never once was, uh, have we been notified or invited to any of those meetings to discuss this, never have we been able to represent our case. And I disagree with Mr. Van Paris that, that we aren't within the district because my understanding is this whole thing revolves around whether or not the house is already within sewer district number five, and it's simply a connection to. The house is located within sewer district number five. It was platted that way. It was designed that way from the beginning, and, and we simply want to move forward. Okay. Do you have a legal description of the sewer district? Because yes. Okay, and it includes that in the legal? Those lots in the legal description? Yes, the house is in the legal description. Well, are you saying the drawing is the legal description? Because um, the survey the would show the adjacent properties also, but what defines the actual sewer district is a legal description. There's the plat and the legal description of the sewer district. That's the plat, but do you have the legal description of the sewer district? That's not it. That's what it was designed to. No, that's not the legal description of the sewer district. What is the legal description? It's it's actually a meets and bounds legal description. It's not a plat or a survey. It's a it's a. So so when this was designed, I think and we, we invested six hundred thousand dollars into developing a lagoon for one hundred houses. Now that we've built that lagoon, you're telling us that we can only connect thirty eight. No, what I'm is saying that, is that what we're saying. No, what I'm saying is you're showing us a plat that shows all the adjacent properties. Also, doesn't mean they're in the sewer district. What you need is the actual meets and bounds legal description, and that did not include those two lots. So you're looking at the plat, confusing a survey as the legal description. This says it's the, the plat from the county. It's a plat. This is where we've been trying to talk to zoning and talk to everybody else to get this figured out. And, and right. again, I think sitting down and discussing this is the next step to getting this resolved. Right, but I think it would help you to understand there's a legal description for the sewer district. And, and I would enjoy that. I would enjoy getting some guidance on this so that we can figure it out because, again, the, the, this lagoon was intended to serve a whole lot more than what it is now, and, and the county as a whole and the sewer district is missing out on additional revenue. And, and um, if that lagoon is, is utilized to what it should be, it would generate more revenue to help pay for sewers and for everything that's got to come in for this thing. So letting it sit and stagnate. But that might be where the, the problem. County. But that might be where the problem is, is it wasn't included in the legal description, and it might have supposedly well, been that, intended and, to. And that could be where the issue is, and, and, and we need to sit down and figure that out and figure out how to modify that so that this plan can go back because everything's sitting stagnant, and and as much as this wants to get segregated out, it really is part of a larger problem that really needs to get resolved. And how do we how do we get this going? How do we get Baser involved? Because this is also within Baser city limits. How do we resolve this without everybody sitting down at the table and figuring it out? Because we can't, we can't do anything until somebody sits and talks to us. Well, get a copy of the legal description. I think that would help you understand. Okay, who do I get that from? Public Works. Okay. We'll do that. Tell them you need a legal description of the sewer district, okay. <laughs> not a flat or a survey. The actual meets and bounds description. Okay, I'll do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. You ready for executive yeah. session? Sure. Mr. Chairman, I move this board recess for a closed executive session meeting for the discussion of potential litigation involving the legal interests of the county as justified by KSA seventy five dash forty three nineteen B two. For cons consultation with legal counsel for the board, which would be deemed privileged in the attorney-client relationship, and that the board resume meeting at 11.05, 20 minutes, is that what you need? Yeah, 20. 11.05 this morning, uh, present in the meeting room, uh, executive meeting will be Commissioners Culbertson, Cause, Mike Smith, Doug Smith, Stephen, Senior County Counselor Dave Van Paris, and County Administrator Mark Loffrey. Second. Okay. Motion and second. Aye. 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 And aye. All righty. Board has returned to regular session at 11.05 a.m. No action was taken. No decisions were made. The subject was limited to potential litigation. That being said, now additional public comment. Anybody? Mike? Any question. Um, and this is for the county councilors there, are, and I guess the rest of the board. Uh, is is there a way we can research 
into whether the county can either join or bring our own lawsuit uh, in regard to this uh, executive order uh, from the president on this core civic issue? Uh, we can certainly research it, Commissioner. I think the standing issue is going to be paramount, and that Lovemore County, while it's peripherally impacted, uh, may not be uh, in position to actually challenge the executive order itself. Uh, and I'm not certain what other actions are being taken. I do know some of the other states are looking at it. I think it might be more appropriate if the state attorney general were to look at that. Okay. Can you check that out and bring I that will, back to us? I will try to. I'll check it out. Thank you. Okay. Can we also get a work session scheduled on that relatively soon? I was going to ask if it would be okay if we scheduled a work session on an off day. That's right. not a normal right. meeting day because um, we have several work sessions that are right. stacking up, and I didn't want to push them off. So That's why I kind of brought so that up, on if, doing it on an off day. Uh, you know. If there would be a day that works best for you all. Um, or, if, or if one you know is going to be short, we could add it to that one. Well, I just I want to make sure that we're not. If you can coordinate that with, you know, we have this other uh, committee that it, maybe we do it in the morning of that, you know. Well, I'm asking the board now yeah, if there's I'm a day that works one. better, a time that works better, mornings or afternoons, what days mornings of the week. Mornings work better for me. What about Most Thursday mornings every other week? <laughs> Whatever. What's our next meeting, 29th? Next Thursday. Yeah. yeah. I'm good, but mornings are better for me. So next but Thursday morning, work. potentially. What's that for? Next Thursday morning. Yeah. Everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. okay. That way I can put it on the agenda as a scheduled meeting. I don't have okay. to do a, pub, a special notice. What day? What month? What day of the month is that? I, I've got the 29th. The 29th. Okay. Hopefully, I'm going to be leaving town to go to my grandson's graduation that weekend. So I want to make sure we're not leaving early or anything to. So you're not that should <laughs> you're not leaving early now. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, Thursday morning. Uh, First grandchild. It doesn't matter. College is mine. We'll let you right. We can. Uh, <laughs> but that it, works. I, I yeah, I mean, if all else, I mean, even if I was out of town, I could call in. Or, yeah, we could go evening. Yeah, I could. Yeah, we could right, leave yeah. evening. You could so be it's on not, the phone. Yeah, but yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm, Thursday. Thursday, we're good then. Thursday morning, 29th. Yeah. Sounds good. Mike, you have anything else? That's it. Doug. Uh, I have Fairmount Township meeting tonight. They moved it on a Wednesday night tonight because they couldn't do <laughs> it. you all flipped them right. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> and then I, you know, I had Baser City Council last week, and that was a very productive meeting. Uh, we'll talk about some of that stuff in the future. And I think that's about it. I'm not important. Vicky. Uh, participated in the Port Authority meeting yesterday. Um, there was nothing, I don't think anything substantial to report. Commissioner uh, Culberson might think so, but we, we kind of. I guess it depends who you ask. Yeah, I think it just depends. I think it depends on, <laughs> depends on who you ask. They are going to, I mean, I know that they're, they're going to present to and, and bring information to all of the municipalities regarding the transportation plan and, and assisting with, yeah. um, with uh, paying for that and bringing it the last person or group to the, the county. They had last night's city commission meeting seemed that they were very amiable and, and yeah. agreeable to kicking in their portion, which I think was nine thousand dollars. Ninety, I think it was, yeah. Ninety, I meant ninety thousand yeah. dollars, which um, then they'll go to the different cities and 30, they plan 10, to be with yeah. us yeah. in May. Um, and uh, I just wanted to let y'all know that on the fifth of May uh, commission meeting I will be with uh, the county clerk at the county clerks association meeting. Rep they, she invited me to come. They, it's her year to uh, uh, host, yeah. and she asked me to accompany her because that way, you know, we can be in and out of her room and things and not appear with any improprieties going on. <laughs> no, no, it'll be you know, I'll be uh, going with her for that okay. and attending the sessions, uh, representing the county commissioners in that meeting and it'll be in Kansas City because that was the only place they could accommodate the meeting at the time. Good. And I think that uh, other than that, I'll report next week for whatever we have going on after that. So, so they're doing in-person meetings? Now. Yes, they will be, it will be in person. I'm glad we get back to those things. That's awesome. Yes. Yeah. And so, okay, Jeff. 
Yeah. Nothing big. I had the Port Authority meeting and uh, Kickapoo Township meeting last night. Nothing big to report. All righty. Nothing else. Could I get a motion? Yeah, I, I just really think we need to recognize Mr. Knoll and all the public work staff that oh. worked so hard to get us these matched funds for these yeah. projects. Because there's not no easy way. Folks. They're not they're easy. And there's no way really the, the county can afford to do That's these right. projects without the matching funds. In a 90-10, you just don't hear that. Awesome. You just don't hear it. That's so right. I just think That's that. Right. And just our, our county employees in general, since it's county, that this month we're, we're uh, recognizing, recognizing and celebrating yeah. our right. county employees yeah. that yeah. we yep. continue to give them our gratitude because that's what makes everything work. Yeah. You know, it's so, not us. Yeah. <laughs> it's the employees. I think like Doug is saying, too, I so we're more in the game now before if you go to the table and request funds, then your Thank opportunity you. to receive and you, people know you if you just sit back and say oh we're not going to get it you never will so you're, you're right Doug. hats off to bill on that but i think i think i've seen some really good uh, a lot of good county employees that they're just stepping up to the plate I'm, I'm excited to see where this county's going but that's my two cents well, i just want to make sure that <clears throat> commissioners continue to support these efforts because absolutely i was here long enough that yes we didn't have support yeah in the road department yeah i used to watch you uh, <laughs> You know, it just, well, that's You're all right. I'm going to say. You're I'm going to take the high road. I was talking to somebody yesterday, and we were visiting about roads in Leavenworth County. Mm -hmm. They were saying, in the last three years, we probably paved more roads than in the last 30 years. That was oh, me. Yeah. And <laughs> Absolutely. Maybe that was you. Yeah, that was me. I don't remember who but I we have to make sure that we have the capacity to keep to maintain them, too. Right. right. But, like but by that's, requesting I mean, that's the state a, return our LAVTR funds. That's an achievement, though. <laughs> I mean, that is that is really something that the yeah. taxpayers should know. That Did not raise the mill levy you know. to do it. David, do you have something you want to? Commissioners, I'd just like, since we're kind of editorializing commissioner smith's comments about support by the commission are not or should not be taken lightly uh, i am personally familiar with the fact that prior county commissions deprived public works of well over 10 million dollars of funds that should have been going into county roads and this is over a period of several years but that's a 10 million dollar deficit in exactly. the county's road system that still at some point will have to be made up and that was because those commissions did not support the public works that's project. Right. So you should be applauded for doing so. And that's one of the things me and Commissioner Smith did when we started was that we noticed that they were sitting on a lot of these funds. Absolutely. And they weren't doing anything. So, Well, there's a reason why I left the road department and came here. <laughs> okay. it, it wasn't to keep doing the same thing. Thank you, David. Anything else? No, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All right. Aye. Aye, aye, aye. Aye. And we are adjourned. Thank you.